You're listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast with service members from across the military sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark Zeno. Welcome into the Hazard Ground Podcast. As always, we appreciate you joining us each and every week before we get to this week's story about a Purple Heart recipient in Afghanistan who is now combating mental health, PTSD, and isolation in veterans and first responders. We'll get to him coming up in just a moment. As we continue with our normal announcements of uh, make sure you guys continue our promotion with Amazon, go to our website, hazardground.com. Click on the Amazon button at the bottom of the homepage or under the Sponsors tab. It'll redirect you to Amazon. You can do all of your normal Amazon shopping. And uh, we will get a percentage of what you guys spend, and then we'll donate a percentage of that back to some of the charities and organizations you've heard featured here on the show. So it's an easy way to support veterans charities just by doing your normal Amazon shopping as well. Follow us on all the social media sites, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hazard Ground at Hazard Ground Podcast. Keep up with the show. Of course, we love hearing from you guys in the DMs and the messages that you send us. So don't hesitate to reach out to us as well. You can send us an email, producer at hazardground.com. Uh, continue with the guest suggestions. We certainly appreciate that. Also, there's a box on our website to give us guest suggestions. So uh, a great way to stay interacted with us as well. And then, of course, please continue to leave us five-star reviews on Apple. However you get your Apple podcast, leave us a five-star rating. Tell us why you love the show. We appreciate that as well. Helps grow the algorithm and the show uh, popularity over on Apple Podcasts. Again, a five-star review. So we certainly appreciate it. All right. Um, and again, I apologize for kind of like the orange tone on my face. As I told you, my studio last week, my studio got destroyed uh, when my pipes burst over the holidays. So uh, we are uh, we, we are flying by the seat of our pants here, but we got our normal background back, just a, an odd colored host. So uh, I'm going for the whole orange is in Donald Trump kind of look, I guess. You know, never mind. Anyway, let's get to this week's guest. Uh, a former Army specialist who just spent four, short, four and a half short years in the military, but a combat deployment to Afghanistan uh, where he was awarded the Purple Heart for his injuries, also spent another deployment in Africa uh, while in the U.S. Army, then left the Army and co-founded a company called Project Refit, which currently is combating isolation, but working with military veterans and first responders, uh, battling PTSD, mental health, uh, and combat trauma after a traumatic event. And he is Daniel Lombard joining us here on the Hazard Ground Podcast. Daniel, welcome, and thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. Yeah, again, uh, I'm, I'm not normally this orange. I mean, I'm tan, I'm just not normally this orange. Uh, anyway, no, listen, it's great to, to have you on here. Excited to tell your story. Uh, you know, and I stumbled on Project Refit, you know, as I continue to kind of just scour the web for organizations that are out there um, that are working with veterans because it's always a great place to find guests for the show. Uh, I stumbled on Refit and, and thought it was fantastic uh, what you guys are doing and, and specifically the idea of combating isolation because that's something we talk about so much you know, there's a tendency to withdraw uh, after everything that we've been through and sort of be by ourselves because we don't feel like anybody understands what we've went through. But uh, we'll get to Project Refit here in just a, a little bit, but we want to hear your story first. And you're actually a fairly young guy, and you only spent four years in the military. All of this, like, you know, just within the last 10 years. So how and why did you get in the Army? So I, was, I actually went in at uh, 23, so I'm 32 right now. Went in at 23. Um, I was I – was, I was at a point in my life where I just really wasn't doing much. I didn't have much motivation, much, much drive. I didn't, I hadn't done anything to sow my oats to say. Um, and uh, part of it was probably escaping family life, you know, like half the people who joined the military it is. Um, and then uh, I wanted, so I wanted to gain, I knew the military, or at least I thought it would give me drive, determination, motivation, purpose. Um, and I, I got every every single every single thing out of that. Uh, so I'm, there there aren't really any regrets with it. <laughs> I just got a, a few extra things along the way. No, not at all. But I mean, look, you know, you signed up. What was it in 2013? Um, yeah. And yeah, May, May of 2013. You know, we're already out of Iraq. Um, you know, by all accounts, we're hearing you know Afghanistan eventually will come to an end at some point in time. Did you think that combat was in the picture for you? No. Uh, when you signed up? No. No, no, I didn't. Even even in basic, it wasn't really talked about at all. Um, wow. And then I got I got sent to Fort Bliss. Um, that's where I was. That's my duty station was at for the whole the whole the entirety of my army career was at Fort Bliss. Um, <clears throat> so when when my drill sergeants saw that, they're like, oh, that sucks. Um, I I who was it? two guys, two guys from my basic training class came to Fort Bliss with me. 
and we are the only ones from that class one of i think there's i think there's two or three more that actually deployed we were the only ones i didn't i got told when i came to the base like when they picked me up from um just first getting there that i was going to egypt in two months um I don't know who put you know. I mean, people just say things. I don't know where they pulled that from. Um, but it was I got to Fort Bliss, and two months later, I was in uh, Afghanistan. I didn't do NTC. I did the the, the little uh, IPT, like the little um, uh, what I not, not IPT, whatever the it's like the thirty day N NTC. It's a mock one. CRC. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I did that, and it, it, I I I did, I don't think I got I got the necessary uh, tools yet. Just two months out, but but I went I went to Afghanistan. What, um, winter was when was we your, got there. What was your reaction when you told you were going? I mean, like you call your family and be like, "Oh yeah, I got some news. Uh, I just got here and I'm going to Afghanistan." Like, what's what's yeah. swallowing that emotional pill like? I, I think because I mean I was infantry, so it was it was craved almost. You know what I mean? It was, I'm going right. to go do my job. I never had the, like, I, I, when I was a team leader, I would ask kid, like the, one of the kids when they first came, why'd you join? And the, the half of them would say to kill somebody. And like, that's no, like that, that was never in my wheelhouse. So I wasn't excited to do that. Um, but I did, um, I trained as an infantryman. So I was excited to deploy and use my training. Um, so I was, I was excited. I, 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 I'm pretty sure I called my, uh, my family and my mom at least and, and told, uh, I told her I was going and she, she knew me. Um, obviously I was, I was a very, um, soft individual. Um, I felt a lot of things. Uh, so she knew Afghanistan was going to tear me up. I, she, so, she kind of, she, funny. she, 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 so but it did. you're one, you're one of the few people who at, who at uh, basic training got issued feelings. Uh, they don't usually <laughs> yeah. hand those out at basic training. So I, <laughs> Good for you, I suppose, <laughs> I, or or bad for you, I guess. Yeah, it's, it's hard to here, say right now. <laughs> you know, in a, in a little bit. Um, do you, are you told where you're going in Afghanistan? Um, no, uh, no, I, I we weren't told that. I don't. I remember we weren't told that until like right before. Um, at, at least me, like the private little fuzzy guy. Um, and then we were told. Uh, uh, I was in Shindan Province, um, uh, Herat. Um, so we were in West Afghanistan. I, none of that meant anything to me. You know what I mean? I didn't know the layout of Afghanistan. I didn't know some of it was fields. Some of it was mountain. I didn't know anything about it. Um, I think just as, just with my view from growing up, seeing uh, the, the combat footage on the news and whatnot, or, or Facebook or MICE or whatever it was, um, you have this idea that Afghanistan's always hot. Always. 100% of the time. And that was a very rude, rude awakening for me. <laughs> Uh, there are times in Afghanistan where it's more cold than it is hot, especially mm -hmm. when you are in the mountains where there's yeah. not a lot of warm, cozy air. Yeah. All right. So um, you get on the ground in Afghanistan, and obviously you're like, we're not in Kansas anymore. Yeah. Um, are you sort of overwhelmed initially and emotionally like, oh, my God, how did I end up here? No, we actually got a pretty soft integration into it. So it's, so where we, where we were um... – None of our units had patrolled outside the wire um, off of the Harbaugh Road in five years. So the Taliban had overrun all of the, all of the surrounding villages. Um, so we were FOB security. So we weren't even initially going outside of base. So there, was, there wasn't really that uh, impending fear yet. You know what I mean? It wasn't, that wasn't an option, so it wasn't a thought. Uh, we had our training. We, when there was IDF, we would act to that, but that, that was the extent of it. But we, so we were a heavy weapons company. Um, we had a, our command sergeant major. He's the only guy we lost. Um, his name was Gunny, uh, command sergeant major, Martin Barreras. He was actually a Marine for six years. And then he was in the army for 22, um, 75th Rangers, uh, the Jessica Lynch rescue mission. He, uh, he headed that. Oh, he, wow. Yeah. He brought her to the bird. He brought the a couple of the guys that went down. He brought them back. Um, very monumental man. Um, excuse me epitome of a leader like i got spoiled i got my best leadership in the beginning and my second unit was the worst leadership um so our leadership pushed for us to start doing outside missions the the italians were in, in charge of that ao um so we got we got gifted with doing some screen lines so we'd be able to go and watch some of these villages, six, seven, eight hundred meters out, um, see what they were doing, and then and then go from there. So we, it was January twenty eighth. Um, we were on our way to a, a screen line, and uh, we got a January twenty eighth, twenty fourteen. 
Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Just for the time frame. Yes. Um, so we got a call from Marcia. They had five. The PTID saw that they had five identified enemies, saw their weapons, engage on contact. So we turned the lights off. We had the IR lights on and whatnot, and we're just bumping through the the, the fields. And I was lead vehicle, uh, back right seat, um, so the dismount. Uh, my gunner was a, a, a 240. Uh, so they shot an RPG-7 at the uh, front of our vehicle. It missed by, I think Pete had said, like 10 feet. Um, and then, so they all engaged. My gunner's gun jammed immediately. So I had to give him my M4, gave him like four or five mags. Um, so they engaged, obviously, uh, the, the fire, that firefight probably went on for uh, five, 10 minutes, just the, cause it was just, we had five mounted weapons. Um, so all the dismounts got out. I took the driver's gun, uh, and we all, we lined up, uh, we lined up and we assaulted through. So, uh, Pete was watching. So I actually, that was the first time that I, uh, shot somebody. So there was a, uh, one of the guys was rolling around in the end. He actually still had his, hit the AK in his hand. Uh, cause there was a dragon of an RPK an AK and the RPG, um, launcher with, with a couple, uh, I think it was like four or five rockets. So I saw him with his gun. So I didn't remember. I said, I didn't go to NTC. I didn't really get, uh, I got basic training in AIT. So real quick, I mean, it's nighttime, nods on, I'm looking. So I, I asked my squad, like, do I, do I shoot? Because at this point, they emphasize, like, war crime, war crime, can't do this. So I'm not, I'm not going to prison. That, that's just not for me. Um, so he's like, yeah, do go. So I, I fired three or four rounds, um, and then the gun jammed because our driver of that vehicle was a bad soldier. He was a good driver. He was a bad soldier. He never cleaned his weapon. Um, he only drove the whole deployment. Um, so his gun jam, luckily that was the end of the firefight. So we, uh, we got all their stuff. Um, we missed the, our number one HBT was, uh, a click up, um, click North and, uh, cause they were two separate groups that were patrolling the village. Um, and they, they had squatted away. So the, so we lost the, the number one HBT on that one. All right. So that's your first foray into the combat experience. You mentioned it's the first time you, you fire your weapon and, and you kill the enemy. Yeah. Um, being this sort of soft, emotional guy that you are, do you, do you, when you get back, do you start to reflect on this or you just kind of compartmentalize it, put it away and don't even think about it? Yeah, I think it was the, it, I think it, I, I was an infantryman. I was, I was, that's, that was what I was right there. Um, I didn't like, so they, we had two fifty cals, two two forties, and a Mark nineteen that were uh, mounted. Two of them were Crow, um, a fifty and a two forty, or yeah, fifty and two forty were Crow. So um, they, they weren't M four shooting these dudes. It tore them like it. It pieces were off. Um, so I stepped on a brain. It was actually in the shape of Africa. So it's somebody's somebody's lobe got launched off of their head. Um, and I, I didn't even then it was it was like I I, I can remember the, the the squishing of it. Um that didn't mess me up. That it that wasn't like, oh shit. Now, like once I started therapy, once I started putting things where they were supposed to be, affects me differently than it did then. But yeah, it, i I definitely compartmentalized what, what happened. I, I don't I don't think I thought about it that way. I didn't think of it I didn't think of it as something that actually had to be thought about in all honesty. I think it was this is the job. I'm doing my job. Did you remember what you told anybody about the experience after it happened? No, no. Um, I see the, so the, while we were doing, we had to do the, the, the BD, BDA on all of that on their, um, on them. And so we had to wait for the Afghans to come and there was a, a ravine. It was a pretty good one. And we had to jump over it and almost every single person, one foot landed in it. So I was one of the ones that my foot landed in it. Um, so that, that was really, it's kind of weird. Like we obviously talked about the firefight, sure, but but not like that. It wasn't. It was kind of like, is there going to be another one? It, was this a, a one time deal? Um, I I don't I, I don't remember if 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 we actually. If, I I don't think I specifically talked about um that like what I did, what I stepped in. Like I didn't. I think it was turned off there. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. So the, the deployment continues. Um, you know, you, you get through that first combat experience unscathed physically. Do you feel like, okay, that was easier than I thought it was going to be? Or uh, are you just like, do you start to feel a sense of 
in sort of your youthfulness and time in the military, your naivete that you guys feel a little bit invincible? Yeah, I think that's what solidified the, 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 uh, the feeling of invincibility. Invincibility. Um, they shot an RPG at my vehicle and it missed. You know, and twice actually they shot it at the front and then at the back. Um, it's it, it, it that it, doesn't mean you're invincible, it just means they're a shitty shot. Yeah, a hundred percent. That's exactly <laughs> what it means. <laughs> but me back then, yeah, no, I definitely yeah, that just definitely bad contributed aim. to it. me being being like, oh, shit. <laughs> I that was my first like real brush with death. Like, I had some like random stuff as a civilian, you know what I mean? Like, ra- like, right. nothing like me. Ma- this was like the first for sure I almost died. 10 more feet and I'm dead. Um, so, so that that happened, but the, so February, um, 21st was the big one. That's when I got blown up. Um, so we hadn't, we hadn't seen combat. So February 20 or January 28th was the firefight. And then February 21st was the first IED. Um, so we, we were coming back from a, a, a KLE with one of the, uh, um, uh, Afghan leaders and, right. Um, we had taken two Air Force girls with us because joint relationship. Um, so my team leader had to get he he was left back in the talk, and I forget I forget who else was. So it had just rained. It was nighttime. We were driving in a wadi, so like it's a recipe for fucking disaster, you know. Um, there's 45 puddles. So so my my lieutenant was African American. Um, literally though, he was from a tribe in Africa and became American. Um, and so he was, he was the only black person though, the only one, uh, all the other lieutenants were white. So the Taliban saw, oh, and our vehicle, you know, every single it's tan, all the vehicles are tan. Ours was the old green, brown, you know what I mean? The dark, the, uh, the dark colors. The OD green, baby. It was an easy target. It was the easiest target. That guy's in that vehicle. Boom. We know it every time. Um, so apparently they put a hit out on our vehicle. So we were in the I we were in the wadi. I was driving. Um, I have a I look at people when I talk to them. So him and I were talking about how we were the only platoon who hadn't gotten blown up yet in the deployment, and you know turn boom. So when I turned to look at him to talk, my lead vehicle had made its turn. I was the second vehicle in formation. Um, so they had made their turn up onto the Harbaugh Road. So because the Afghans used the um, the wadis as a, as a driving system. Also, there's a lot of track marks and I, I couldn't tell which ones were my vehicles and which ones were civilians. So I had to guess. Um, I guessed wrong. I drove over the pressure plate. It was, uh, it was at least a 200 pound IED. Um, it hit the back left tire. So it, it blew, I don't, yeah, that went away. It blew that away, um, ruptured the fuel and oil lines. So it immediately started a fire. I didn't have my, we were in Matt V's by the way, sorry. Um, I didn't have my door combat locked and my interpreter didn't have his combat locked, but the, uh, the other two were. So my gunner Bravo, which this is actually a picture of Bravo. Um, oh, really? Yeah, the, the guy standing up, that's a, it's an outlined picture of Bravo that we, we outlined and put it, uh, put it on us. So that's him and this is me. So you'll, uh, this story actually is what this derives from the logo. Um, so, when the IED went off, so I didn't know how this shit worked. I didn't know that there was an implosion and an explosion. I just thought it was a just a big ass pop. Um, right. You learn things. So the only thing that saved our lives was the fact that I did not combat lock my door and the interpreter did not combat lock his door. It gave the pressure somewhere to go. So when the IED went off, it imploded and exploded. It went out the gunner's hatch and my two our two doors. It ripped my helmet off and Bravo. It just fucking snapped the gunner's harness and he landed on the hood, blacked out. Um, so I, my helmet ripped off as the gust went out. Um, and I hit my head on, we had our DVE screen. It was folded up, but I had my, I hit my head on the DVE screen, um, blacked out for a minute. Some, you know what I mean? Somewhere around there. Um, so when I came to, it was like, it's, I don't, it was like the movies, the, the, it, it was slow motion, the dust, like you could pick each individual granule out of the air. It's, it, it's not even moving. Um, uh, uh, the ring in the ears, which everybody knows that shit, but, uh, my life flashed before my eyes. And, uh, I don't, I don't, I right now do not remember what flashed, but I remember the emotion and the feelings that came with it. And it was nothing but positive and like, and, and good feelings. So through therapy and whatnot, that's my brain either preparing me to die making it as easy of a process as it could be, or it's giving me 
clarity to get out of the negative situation I'm in and survive. Um, so I, I had my IOTV on and I had the uh, triple mag pouch uh, with the double one, you know what I mean? So I, I had six <laughs> mags, so I was, I was thick there. So I couldn't climb out of the, the, the right because it's the radio mountain there. There was about a foot of room. I'm in shock. I'm in fight or flight. So I don't think to take my IOT, just pull the cord. Um, I can't jump out the left because there's a lake of burning fire. I'm in a wadi. I don't know if it's an ambush. I, I know nothing of that situation where there's one IED. There's usually two. Too many options for the left. No. And so I can't climb over. So I'm trapped. Um, we, so that was the Mark 19 vehicle also. So we had 620 40 mic mics in there. Um, one, of the, one of the dismounted gunners had left a 100 round belt of 762 and that actually was cooking off while I was in the truck. Nice. Don't, I don't, yeah, don't know how I didn't get, get, didn't get clipped by that at all, <laughs> but thank God. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Mm. Um, so I remember screaming to my Lieutenant, I'm on fire and I can't get out. I, I cannot get out and I'm on fire. So my legs, so I was like, I was facing the radio mount. So my, my ass and my legs are out of the, uh, of the vehicle and I'm like shifting my legs. So like one leg is fully in pain and the other has like 10% pain. You know what I mean? So just so there's some breakup in it. Um, what I found out later on, because Bravo and I actually had the same um, psychiatrist and, and psychologist when we got back to uh, for bliss was picture somebody burning alive picture that like the blood curdling screams of somebody burning alive that's what i was really doing my brain will not i can't i can't even picture what that sounds like my brain will never ever it's blocking that one for good um but that's actually what bravo woke up to that's what got him out of his um uh, concussed state so now were you actually on fire though or you just yeah. thought you were on fire no okay. I, was, I was yeah okay. i was so i so i actually so the dude i, I don't know Something in the army actually worked that they gave us the my uniform. Like I said, it was probably like it was probably a minute. You know what I mean? Minute, minute and a half of just not. It's it, yeah. Um, I didn't have fuel on me or anything, so it's the the burns I got were I actually got flash burns. So it was the I didn't know this. The light from the IED burnt me. It wasn't even the fire. It was the light from the bomb going off is what burnt my my exposed skin. So I had like a fucking like a sunburn. It went away in like a week. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um but a nice nice concussion with it too um so i uh but your, your fire retardant uniform actually was fire it, retardant it, it actually it actually go worked for, go it figure. actually worked i'm sure my skin was toasted but nothing was melted like i have no burn mark but no burn scars at all um so i i jumped out of the i i inevitably took my kit off it it, it, it clicked eventually that that uh i i should just take my kid off. And then I climbed over the radio mount. As I climbed out, Bravo jumped on top of me. So he had his M9. Um, I don't remember if he had body armor on at all. Um, I know he, he had his M9, that's all he had. So he was scanning the, uh, the top of the wadi when we jumped out with the uh, M9. Um, we ran to the, <clears throat> we got consolidated and then we ran to the lead vehicle was what, 7,500 meters away. We ran to that um, and uh, we were supposed to run in formation, but I, I, I I'm, wasn't there. So I, like a metal like Usain Bolt marathon, just sprinted right for that vehicle. <laughs> you were not, you, I knew that was my goal. That's where I'm getting right there. So I burned out. Um, I, I jumped in the seat and we had our combat shirts on and, and whatnot. So mine had a shit little holes. Um, so my, my squad leader like punched me in the chest and like pushed me back to check to see if it was shrapnel. Um, it was when I climbed over the radio mount, the radio mount just ripped my shit in a bunch of places, on my shirt, no skin, my shirt in a, a bunch of places. Uh, uh, just out of curiosity, that's a yeah. weird way to check for shrapnel by inflicting pain by punching the shrapnel. I mean, I think he was a little, I, not like, not, but like, sit, you know what I mean? A sit, like, yo, sit back. I think he was also, uh, um, it's like, a, a hey, bit. look at this cut right here. And you're like, oh, that right there? Yes, that right there, stop hitting it, yeah. <laughs> it's squirting. <laughs> <coughs> excuse me um so they they cleared they cleared the bird to come um so the reason i mentioned that there was two air force girls was because like i said we were army infantry and that was so that was m one of my one of the team leaders wanted those girls to come on that's what that was 
he that, that's everyone knew that that's what that was i'm sure they pinned it as like a joint operation thing but they they were leaving in two weeks there was no actual reason for them to come out on mission you know what i mean and the logistically um right. so i jump in the vehicle and i was uh so i'm in the back right passenger seat looking at this air force girl and she's she's been on this base for nine months nothing's happened she's sitting there like white, white eyed um, I had my cell phone on me because I was, uh, I was engaged at that point. So you can look at, look at pictures of your ex and shit or your, <laughs> your ex. Um, so I'm freaking out. I, I'm smoking. I'm freaking my phone. Where's my phone? And she's like, what? And I find it, throw up, freak the fuck out. Um, that should have been my team leader in that seat. Should have been my team leader. That always pissed us off that, that, it, it, that, that big of an event happened and somebody who wasn't supposed to be there was there um went back to so yeah they they cleared they cleared a lz uh up on the on on the wadi but the bird landed in the wadi like 100 and 100 150 feet away from the 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 burning mat v 40 mic mics cooking off at that point and they land 150 meters it made no sense to me so i have to run past the ied um went back to base and i didn't know at this point that when you get hurt you have to call home. There's no option, or at least that's what they told me. I don't know if that's true or not. <laughs> um, so I had to call. I had to call my mom. Uh, she works at a school. We would talk over. Uh, um, Is that phone? No, no. We would talk over Facebook. Like whenever oh, if, the okay. if the internet was working, that was the only time. So if she got a phone call from me, she knew something was awry. Um, so I told her. I said, you know, I got I got blown up, mom. Um, I'm good. You know, what I mean, I got burnt a little bit, but. My limb, there's no gashes. I'm, not, I'm, my limbs are here. I'm all right. But like I what said, what did she say? Game, she, she, she didn't say a lot, but she knew, she knew my character prior to the military and and what going through something like that would do to the character. Um, so that was her biggest fear. She knew I got PTSD right there, right there. She knew it. Um, so then a couple months later, uh, I think like two months later, we had our second IED. I was only like 8,500 pounds, no fire. Um, but so something that always something that tears me up is is uh, I I take blame for the first IED. I used to take 100 percent blame. It was my fault and nobody could tell me any different um, Why? because I was driving. I took my eyes off the road. I was having a conversation and did not follow the vehicle in front of me when the vehicle made a turn. I didn't see its tire tracks. Now, in reality, with how many tire tracks were there? Could I still have messed that up? Yes. So that's why I take like some of it back. You know what I mean? It's not a hundred percent me, but I could have done more. Um, so that was Bravo's first concussion. Well, I, 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 I will add this because I've said this a, a hundred times, if not more on the show, you realize in reality, you could have followed the same exact mm -hmm. path and you could have had the same exact sure. result. But there's also so, a chance I may not have just well, be paying attention. I mean, the other way to look at it is this. You follow the tracks and the guy behind you doesn't, that vehicle gets blown up. Yeah. yeah. I and mean, then, so if you're, see, none if of I, us died. None of us in that IED died. Right. They could have then. That's what, that's what I'm saying, though. I used to be, like, so engrossed in it is my fault. I fucked right. this up. Where now it's, no, that, that happens. That happens in combat. I could have done an iota more, just looked, and that, then it wouldn't be my fault at all, period. On the upside, you gave the Air Force girls a cool story. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there was you had that going for you. So yeah. Um, so that's IED number one. Now, is that were you actually awarded a Purple Heart for that? Yeah, that's the one that I was your Purple, purple Heart, heart okay. for. All right. Yeah, but there's still more to do here, obviously. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 No. Yeah. Okay. This was like this was like this is two months, two three months. This is three months into the deployment. And um, by the way, Gunny is still alive at this point. Yes, Gunny is still alive. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. That actually fits perfectly. So we didn't have extra gear. All of my shit burned in the fire in the first IED. So I couldn't go. So I had the time frame that I had to wait for injuries to go back out on mission. And then it was like a week or two and I'm still not out on mission. So I'm like, what am I doing? You know what I mean? Um, so the last we had scrounged enough shit. They had just given us some of the dudes plate carriers. So I got somebody's IOTV. Cool with it. I don't need nothing fancy. Um, so I run into Gunny and he asked how I'm doing from the IED. I'm, you know, I'm good. I'm waiting to go back on a mission. So the only thing I need is uh side plates. I don't have side plates. Um, and he said, well, I have, 
I have a spare pair of side boots. I will give you them for the remainder of the deployment. Just give me when we get back. I said, cool, awesome. So he gave me the side boots. So I go. So I'm 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 back out on missions. Um, but it it's it didn't j mentally it it didn't uh, mentally right right after that IED I was going nowhere. I was I was not going back out on mission. I I, I had shut down then. Um, so I I like two days after the IED I think. Um, it may have been the next day. I, I messaged my senior drill sergeant, actually, um, Drill Sergeant Waters. Uh, so he, in, even in basic AIT, he treated me like an adult, like a man. You know what I mean? He knew I wasn't some 18-year-old kid who was just fucking around. And I'm not, I'm not dumb. I, I, I knew the game. I played, I'll, play the, I'll play the game. So he treated me like an adult. So I, I messaged him and uh, explained to him what happened and explained to him where my mental state was. And and essentially he said you're you're going back out on mission like that's happening and you're going to get blown up again it's going to happen you just have to have that mentality it's the only thing that's going to get you through this deal with it after when you get home have this have these thoughts but right now yet you, the dudes around you need you to be back out on and what for whatever reason it immediately just snapped me out of that negative mental space so i made a i made it a point that i was not comfortable driving that that's it. I'll be. I, I love being a dismount. I'll be an AG. I'll be a gunner. I don't like driving. That is all I don't want to do. Um. So I was an AG. I was a. I was a dismount for the majority of the time. I was the. I was the 50 cal gunner, 240 gunner mounted. Um. I was always a small, like 120, 130 pound guy. So I was never <laughs> carrying the the 240. Um. Yeah. So that was that was uh. That's how I started going back out on missions. And then we, so Gunny, Gunny happened. Gunny got shot on May 5th, um, 2014. So he, 6th, I'm sorry, 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 sorry. Um, so we were on a, we were on a three day mission and we were helping the ANA um, spring clean uh, some, some Taliban out of their AO. So we were the ANA's QRF. Um, so when they got ANA got ambushed, like every direction but the direction we were facing um, or coming from to them. Um, so one of our platoons went. Um, Gunny went with them. So they it was like I said, like a six to one. Like it was insane. Um, uh, Gunny uh, Gunny was handing ammo an ammo can a fifty cal can up to to one one of our guys one of the guys I was in basic training with actually, um and I mean you know the story people sniper stray around who the fuck knows but around hit him in the side when it went out the other side, nicked an artery um, fortunately uh, an A and A guy had been hurt right before that so there was already a medevac on the way um, so Gunny got stabilized there flown back to base Germany San Antonio. Um, so in, so what, what the, the last thing I heard, uh, was cause the last thing I heard was that in the middle of the night, uh, May 13th, he, the, the graft on his artery just gave out and he essentially bled to death in the hospital. Mm, excuse me. So that hurt us, uh, uh, I think a lot more than we understood. Mm hmm I, I think it's very easy to pick out bad leadership and, and what bad leadership does to people. But when you're in when you're in the presence of good leadership, it's hard to live in that moment and appreciate the weight that that person carries and what they bring to your life. Um, a lot of us saw him as a father, uh, at least a father figure. Um, so. Yeah, that messed up a lot. Of, that messed us up a lot. Uh, so he. Kinda kind of crazy that uh he had offered to give you an extra set of side plates yeah. and the bullet went through his side yeah i know i know he didn't give you yours he didn't give you his did he i see look man i never thought that until like last year when i had that thought and i was like now but either because we did it when you lift up where it hit him nothing it's not covering it okay. regardless right. if, I mean, if his regardless. arms were dead but no i've had that very thought like oh fuck did, did he give me his fucking that's what, honestly that's what i thought you were gonna tell me when you said it went because, through the well, side that's the type of leader he was, though. That's something he would do because he would want me back out on mission and shit. But, I mean, never I, – I, I don't think that's something we could confirm. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so there was something, though – so when we would come back from mission, and this is something we brought into Project Refit, we brought a lot of Gunny's legacy into Project Refit. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people – 
who knew Gunny know about Project Refit because they, they, they see his, his legacy is really what it is. So whenever we would come back from, from a mission, uh, no matter what the mission was, and nothing bad happened. There were no IEDs, nobody got shot, nothing happened. Um, you know, there's this, why is the sky blue? It's because, God's, it's because God loves the infantry. It's, that's the saying. So whenever we would come back and it was good, he would say, blue skies, boys, blue skies. We're good. We got another day. We're home. We're we're okay. So we 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 adapted and brought that in, adopted and brought that into um, into Project Refit. Uh, um, it's he listened. I think that's really what it was. You know what I mean? Like he he when he asked you a question, he genuinely wanted to know what the fuck the question was about. Like why are you good? No, I need this. Here is that he was a problem solver. Um, so yeah, that was a. That one hurt. That one. That one. Because I mean, like you see, you 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 saw like the dead kids and everything, and that that's a bitter, bitter pill to swallow if it's swallowable at all. Um, but when it's when it's your sergeant major, your command sergeant major, especially him, he was out on missions with us every day, every single day. The the three platoons that were out on missions, boom, one comes back, he's out with the other one, boom, boom. He, he would he would walk like 600 meters away just in in afghanistan just kicking looking for ieds and shit and then we, we would do an aar after it and somebody would men- hey hey sir hey sir major uh and he's like yo look i'm not i'm not command sergeant major barreras out there i'm private barreras i'm on your mission this is your show if i'm going and wandering and fucking your patrol up hey come back pull me back he gave people power and I don't sure. think a lot of leaders do that anymore. Yeah, well, again, uh, that's a whole different podcast in and of itself. <laughs> um, that said, though, when when Gunny ends up getting killed in action, uh, and and you lose a guy like that, does that sense of invincibility you had before immediately go away? Yeah, I think it was shattered. I think I think it was destroyed. It's like Superman being shot right in front of you, and it, it's 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 unfathomable. If anybody was going to get get killed, you don't think it would be him. He was the most qualified person there. You don't think it would be him. Um, and yeah, I, that yeah. So 100%. let me ask you something though. Yeah, you know, you, you had this experience where you get blown up and you're thinking, "I can't go back out there. I don't want to go back out there." You end up going back out there more before this happens with Gunny, and now you lost your emotional leader. You lost your tactical leader. You lost, you know, your your invincibility um was it harder to go back out after that than it was your initial ied no because we had the hatred in us he didn't die mysteriously he was shot you know what no, i mean you, we that, had that you we were, we were getting vengeance we're getting you back we're gonna if yeah. you can't come back we're gonna make sure a lot of them aren't either i think that i think that really took uh the majority of the the stage on on during yeah i think i think that was it um and then i think it was like a week after that our bc was going to one of the other bases in afghanistan and his fucking bird just 100 feet off the gr- ground breaks in half falls so we're, like we're thinking he's fucking dead too he had like broken ribs he was he was messed up but next day he's well like he was Br- colonel brady love mm. so i'm telling him it's such good leadership in the beginning and then my my africa unit was my direct leadership was great but the, the higher ups, garbage, garbage, did you, garbage. Did you ever find uh, the guys who killed Gunny? Um, so yeah, so we went to the the that was in the the, the spring cleaning was in the Zerko Valley. Um, so we had a we had a couple more firefights in the Zerko Valley. Uh, they actually now that you said that it reminded me they actually found the guy who planted my IED the two hundred pound one, um, like two days after two or three days after he had become an informant. So my platoon had to go pick him up and bring him to our base. Oh, that must have been fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you didn't talk to him, did you? No, I was still, I think I was, yeah, I was still in, and I was still getting better. They, they didn't, they obviously wanted to do things, but you can't, obviously. I mean, it's not acceptable. Well, you're not supposed to. Not supposed can't, to. Can't, it's not the You way. can, you're not you supposed can. to. Yes. You're not supposed to. Uh, unfortunately, some people have chosen one over the other. Yes. But again, an entirely different podcast. I'm glad none of mine did. I'm, I'm, I'm glad, you know what I mean? It's, it's, 
I Katie. mean, it, it's got to be a little bit sort of, you know, of a, of a tough pill to swallow knowing that the guy who almost ended your life, um, you know, is now on your side. Hey, welcome, bud. Like, yep. nah, yeah. Nah, how about no? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't see. I, I'm a, all right. I'm a, I'm a pretty decent, I'm, I'm decent when it comes to like being logical and rational. So like, I think because I can, it's a tactical advantage. Like personally, fuck you. Like, are you serious? <laughs> fuck you. But I, I get it. It's, it's shitty, but I get it. Um, so then, yeah, I mean, that's like, I, I was in probably a, a dozen, maybe 15 firefights. I don't, I, I obviously wasn't counting, but it was somewhere around then. Um, is there a point where you feel like I'm going to die here? In the, that first IED, I, I signed my life. I thought I died. Like I, it, I was dead. I didn't think I was coming out of that. I, 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 I made my last breath. Like I, I, I don't know how to, how to word that. Um, that that was me dying. I like I said, yeah. It, it, I did not believe I was living after that fire. I believe that fire was going to take me out, and I was in the process of seeing the last light. Um, after that, the invincibility honestly came back because it's like if that's not going to fucking kill me, um, like we were in a we were in a firefight in the Zerko Valley, and 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 uh, they had made murder holes in the in the village seven eight hundred meters away from us i was on the 50 cal and they're fucking tinging my mat they like Ting. i'm not like <laughs> i was laughing the whole fucking time not maybe not the whole time but it was amusing to me um i had this so we had another company and they didn't see combat so they came to rao so they could get their cibs um so there was so a, important was, by the way so important <laughs> it's gotten me so far it's gotten me so far after the army yeah, um yeah. so they uh there was this one he was a, a very brand new sergeant and um my 50 the the i had the uh i had the new 50 i had the new 50 so the headspace and timing went um so i you know you know it's you put COP on it? Yes. I, it's, that's, we've been fighting for a fucking hour. Like, it's, that's, come on. So he got up into the, into the hatch with me. So we're like both, you know what I mean? Like, it's tight as fuck, and he's trying to do everything I've just done. Um, and we're getting pinged, and he's ducking. And I'm like, all right, can you just, like, get the fuck down, please? Um, that's, that's so fucking annoying. Uh, but that was, yeah, we had, we had probably, like, 12, 15 firefights, and that was the... When... When, when the deployment ends and, you, and you're going home, um, is there, do, do you acknowledge the sense of your relief that you have that you made it out alive? Yeah. What's that? Yeah, there was, there was definitely, I think because we had that, like that prison countdown, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, we got mm -hmm. 26 days. I think that, I think that put it into perspective. You don't think of home the whole time. Home's not in it. Home, it's, we're not, I'm not leaving. When I went there, I believed I was going to die there. I don't know if I went there to die you know what i mean like i don't know if i was with that intent but by the end of the deployment i or not the event but you know what i mean by those traumatic traumatic events i wanted to die i thought that was right it felt like it was part Destiny. of the rite of passage yep. yeah and and it feels like you didn't complete it if you don't that does not make sense you you obviously did complete it you're home you won but that's how that's how it feels no nah, it's so, the whole lieutenant dan thing you yeah. know on forest yeah. Gump. you know like this is what I was predetermined to do. This was what uh, God put me on this earth for. And this is the way it was supposed to end. Yep. Um, and know, it didn't. And, and it didn't, right? Um, so to that end, sort of staying with the, the Lieutenant Dan reference here, Forrest Gump, for so how, how you don't know whoever's listening and watching to this doesn't know that. But anyway, um, you know, is there a moment where when you get back um, – you start to acknowledge the things that have happened to you and start to feel the emotions that are associated with them, or are you still in sort of compartmentalized lockdown mode? Yeah, no, I was still in compartmentalized lockdown mode. So then that, so I was with two, five out of, out of, out of Fort bliss. Um, uh, uh, so we, that, that unit was made specifically for Afghanistan. So when we came back, president Obama declared the war in Afghanistan over. So that unit is disbanded through the rest of Fort bliss. Right. Yes. So I went to 177 Armored um, from Light Infantry to fucking Bradley's. 
Um, so the, it was just a fucking completely different experience. You know what I mean? It was, it was a different army than what I had just come from. And I'm, I'm not old army, you know what I mean? 2013. But where I was, they still treated it that way. Not the toxic shit, not like they're fucked up, but like the realistic understanding shit of, of the old army. Um, so they asked me, hey, do you want to waive your dwell time? And we're going to Africa in four months. And I said, oh, yeah, fuck it. Why not? Let's go. So we went, uh, we were QRF for 13 countries. Um, and this was right after Benghazi. So if, if, if anything similar to Benghazi was happening in any of these 13 countries within 24 hours, we were there in the airport or embassy making it unfucked. Um, we got called up for Sudan. So like we're trained, it's every day we're training. For this, you know what I mean? It's a giant ass fucking C-130 pallets, all that shit. Um, so we got called up, I want to say like maybe three or four times for Sudan never went it, like, I think we actually like got on the bird twice and they were, they nixed it again. Um, so that was mainly training combat pay, but that was all training. So I think because it was all training and not combat, it gave my brain a chance to start processing what the fuck had happened. So my, my fam, my, my, uh, my dad's an alcoholic and all this shit. So, uh, uh like 21, we found this out. Like when I was 21, I found all this shit out. So, um, cut him out of my life. Uh, um, so in Africa is when they start their divorce. So I helped my mom pay for the divorce. Um, and I think that was like the confirmation of civilian world crumbling and then military shit. Fuck, I'm fucked. So I get back from the deployment. Um, I have a little health scare. Uh, I was leak. I was like, there was stuff coming out of my nipples. Like, like it was terrifying so i go to the doctor and they're like your fucking hormones are whacked right now you either have brain cancer breast cancer testicular cancer or it's stress i'm like hey homie it's stress he's like you're getting them all checked first so i don't have cancer or didn't then i still don't but i got got got, got checked then didn't have cancer um so he said you have to go to therapy one time that's it and so obviously I go, you don't have man boobs either then no no okay all right <laughs> <laughs> um so i go and it's uh, Did, by the way, i just i'm just curious i have to rage a little bit here did you tell any of your platoon mates that you were leaking from your nipples so i skipped that part but <laughs> oh, okay i was just gonna say because you know <laughs> no, no, you would have no. got a world you got would have got a world of shit from those guys non-stop yeah. so so you know fruit ninja yes so me and my boy were playing Fruit Ninja, but in real life. I had a kiwi in my hand. He had a fucking butcher's knife. I threw the kiwi up. I was wearing a gray Hanes t-shirt. And he cut the kiwi right down the fucking middle, dead eye. And <laughs> it hit me in the nipple. And there was a wet spot. And he's like, oh, you're lactate. And I was like, dude, you just hit me in the fucking tit with a, with a kiwi. It's, and I lift my shirt up and I squeeze. And then like yellow liquid just starts like oozing out. And I was like, oh. what? what the fuck? So Whoa. I lift the other one, same thing. So I go to, I go to sick call first. So I got to talk to these fucking privates and specialists. Like they're going to know what this is. So I'm a little freak show for about I'm an sorry, hour. I'm sorry. This is the most interesting part of your story so far. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> I was not expecting that. I know. I know. So I'm the, I'm the sick calls little freak show for a good hour, hour and a half. until the PA has an opening. <laughs> I was like, Hey, come look at this. Hey, come here. Look at this real quick. Hey, Hey, come no, on. Here, look have, have you <laughs> ever seen anything like this? All right. I don't know how much I have guys. Like, that's, what, that's when I respond with yes. On a woman breastfeeding. That's when I've seen anything like this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, excuse me. So I start therapy or I, so I go mm -hmm. to behavioral health and it's, a, um, she works in the army. So it's, she's a nice girl. So I, I had a, another bad relationship then. This girl, we had, she had gotten pregnant. Um, don't even know if it was her mom, but she had gotten pregnant and, she, and I wanted a kid then. She, I, was, I was very detached from the world. I was a very cold individual. I didn't feel fuck all. So, so I just think she, you, you, you were the father of the pregnant girl? We, I mean, we, so, so <laughs> she had a, uh, she had a, a miscarriage, but she said God, she had an okay. abortion. So she lied to me and told me she got an abortion instead of what really happened. It wasn't, it was a miscarriage. Um, so I had all that shit fucking mulling around up there. Right. Um, on so top I'm of everything else. Talking about, on top of everything. So I'm telling this girl, she's a specialist in the army. She's younger than I am. And I'm, she's crying two hours of this, of me telling all this and she's crying. I was like, all right should I be crying? Like, is this a me thing or? Um, so I immediately started talking to a therapist and I haven't stopped therapy since. So that was 2000, 
16. Yeah. Is there a moment in therapy where you start to realize the weight of all that has happened to you? So I did something called CPT, cognitive yes. processing therapy. Yes. I'm yeah. Familiar. That's my shit. That, um, that, that made me aware of everything. There's and a lot of homework in that though. And I think that's what did it because so for the beginning of, so it's a 13 week thing, 12 week thing. I forget 12 how many, weeks, yeah. 12 week thing. So for the first like three weeks, I bullshitted it. I didn't do the homework or if I did it with some half ass fucking shit. So 10 minutes before you walked out to the appointment. Yeah. 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 So I, so I, I think I knew, I think back there, I knew like, this is going to be some heavy fucking shit, dude. Like this is going to hurt. Um, so, and I also, I mean, there were so many emotions and feelings. I didn't know what the fuck I was feeling over what, you know what I mean? Do I feel this because of the, the dad shit? Is this Afghanistan? What, what, what the, it's a spectrum of shit. So CPT made me more aware. It made me, I went into CPT with, uh, I think it was 24 stuck points. So triggers for anybody who doesn't know what a stuck point is. Um, so I went in with 24 and I, by the end of it, I had four valid triggers like that were valid behavioral things I had to work on, not something that I had in my head, sit and fester in my head and just believed over time. You know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. And it's hard. It's hard by yourself. It's hard to differentiate what's what. Um, so I think it was that. I think CPT did it. Uh, my uh, Judith where did she didn't. She knew how to work with me, and I think that's what's most important. She knew she could see that I wanted to get better, I wanted to get help, but there was still that callousness there that needed to be peeled away a little bit. And 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 she just knew she knew how to talk to me. If I was fucking around too much, if I was fucking off too much, she would say like, "Yo, yeah, what? Yo, get right right now, write the paper right." Now. Like she would yell. One would say she wouldn't not like that not like she would never curse not like not, not unprofessional she knew i needed a little bit of a push to get where i needed to go right. um the only reason i'm where i'm at now is because of her pushing me to, to get it she so i didn't drive for five years after the ied um so the majority of her work was trying to get me to drive do you want to go to the shop at i was like yeah let's go like, you drive she was like, come on you know that's not happening you know i'm not driving um so she she, I, I, she amazing she was she was amazing so i think it was that and then in in that so when i came home from afghanistan so backtrack a little bit when i came home from afghanistan i had a uh, you know my my friends back home um so we went to the bar and uh james the other co-founder of project refit he is friends with one of those friends so mutual friends um so we got introduced then but i was i was on leave from deployment so i was turned up Tina, you know what I mean? I was getting wasted. Um, so I don't remember meeting him right then, but we met, we talked, exchanged phone numbers, added them on Facebook, like <laughs> we got to know each other. Um, and then uh, I had started therapy. And so this is, this is three, probably a year and a half, two years after therapy, I mean, after Afghanistan. Um, <clears throat> No, you, still have a, you still have a deployment to Africa to go on, though, right? No, no, no. I, that's what I did. The I, nothing happened in the deployment to Africa. You okay. know what I mean? They, I know, they, but they, I'm saying you 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 started therapy after Africa, not no, after Africa. Okay, got it. Yeah, sure, when okay. I came home from Africa. Yeah, so got there was there okay. was Afghanistan was nine so, months. I just for the, for the clarification, yeah. I know you only did four and a half years in the military. After you finish um, Africa, are you like okay? I'm done with this army shit. I'm out of here. No, no, okay. no, 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 not at all. That okay. was something that she, that was a seed she planted, my therapist. Um, I'm glad she did. Um, but that was something she, so just working with me through CPT and whatnot, she, she, she was very open with, I'm putting you in for a med board. Like, that's what I'm doing. If you don't want to get medically discharged and you want to stay in, I will take it into consideration. But like I said, I was with a very toxic unit then. And we're not even going to, I bet, like, again, that's a whole different podcast there. Um, so over a week's time in 2017, whatever, yeah, 2016, 17, um, she said that to me. And then, and then I molded over. And the first day, I'm, I'm not fucking getting out. I'm not, why am I getting out? And then it was, it's by Wednesday, it's, do I get out? Maybe. 
And then by the end of the week, I think all the fucked up shit that unit just did and I'm done. They're not, they don't, my, my CO, so they had kicked too many people out for dumb shit. And they had a deployment to Kuwait coming up. They were doing gunnery six times. For no. Kuwait? For Kuwait. No, in Kuwait, in Kuwait, they're doing gunnery six times. We did gunnery once or twice before it. They did gunnery six fucking times in Kuwait. Look, I just got off back-to-back -back deployments. That's the definition of excessive. If, if we were going on a combat deployment, should I go? No. Would I have? Probably. Yeah. I'm, so I'm in therapy. You're like, I'm, I'm, I, I had started CPT at this point. Like We were in, immersed in it. My CO was trying to force me on the deployment. So I had to go to the fucking OIC of behavioral health. And he said, so you can't deploy. And I was like, well, that's, I'm, that's why I'm here for that. You're, that's you. I'm asking you that. And he's like, no, no, no. So you can't deploy. I was like, oh, yeah, no. Right. Like, I, that's what I'm telling you. Yes. He's like, okay, boom. He made his little fucking shit. And I gave it to the CO. I gave it to my CO. And my CO, so uh, specialist Lombard. Do, do you even want to deploy? And I said, like, I had military bearing my whole fucking time. I never lost that shit. I had, like, cool personal relationships with my team leaders or squad leaders. Like, pr like probably too far. You know what I mean? Like, drinking with them and shit. Like, it, but right. while we're at work, we're at fucking work. You're, you're staff sergeant. You're wh whatever you are. I said, sir, no, I don't want to deploy to Kuwait. <laughs> like, like, I don't. I'm working on my mental health, and you want me to stop that to go on a training deployment fuck you no i didn't say fuck you no um so he said all right well then you're of no use to the army I said, okay sucks I'm still getting out aren't i so i so that's that's really when i was like done there's an, an, another push you got that you didn't know you needed yeah. right yeah 100 percent. yeah all right so then, so so then i i posted on facebook i i made a I, I i had gotten my va percentage so i knew for a fact i was going home um, so I posted on Facebook telling everybody that, uh, I'm not who you knew before the army. I'm not really who you knew after Afghanistan. Uh, um, I've changed. I'm, I'm more irritable now. It's, it's truly not a you thing. It's a me thing and I'm working on it. So bear, fucking bear with me. You know what I mean? Um, so James saw that he saw that as a sign of leadership and he, he hit me up and he asked, uh, so I was still in Fort Bliss. He asked what, um, what the army does to prevent PTSD from happening or suicidal attempts from happening. And if, if they occur, um, how do they combat it? And I was in a very bad spot. So I told him the truth. They do fucking nothing. They give you a percentage. They say you can go to therapy, but like, are they actively doing things now? No. Mm, excuse me. So, and by the way, for those who say James Corbett is the James you keep referring to. He's yes, the co-founder yes. of project refit yes. with you. So we, we didn't officially Thank introduce him yet. Just, you keep saying James, I want everybody to understand who James is. Yes. James Corbett, also the co-founder and president of a uh, project refit. Yes. Thank you. Um, so him and I talked and, and, and I need this, like, I wouldn't be able to do this if this, I would be able to now back then I would not have, if this was just like over the phone or something, I need to see you give a shit about what I'm talking about. Um, it hurts to say it, so I'm not going to waste it. You know what I mean? So I asked him if we could, because we were typing a lot on Facebook. I said, dude, can we like video call? And he's like, yeah, sure. Absolutely. We talked for four hours. I got more out of that four hours than I got in most of therapy. Obviously, like I said, CPT changed my life. But that hour of therapy is what I'm talking about. You have an hour to tell me what happened in a week on top of what whatever else is bothering you that brought you here that's not enough time for me i have too much shit to talk about that hurts so him and he we talked for four hours and it clicked right there like he's one he was he's not a veteran he's not a first responder he went to he's smart he went to school he has the business brain he was an open ear he was an unbiased opinion he just let me dump whatever the fuck thought i had in here whether it was real, valid, true, didn't matter. Get it out of your mind. Talk for four, it was me talking for four hours, spewing. And then by the end, there was an actual weight lifted. We talk about it on Project Refit now, and it, it still happens to this day sometimes. And I, I mean, and I'm in therapy again, still. I mean, um, you have thoughts and they're your thoughts. So why would they be wrong? Why, why would you believe they're wrong? So you sit there and yeah, mm -hmm, yep, mm -hmm, and you're thick. You have to get those thoughts out. I will, I will have a thought 
and I'll say it, it comes out eventually. It, like I'm, I'm not saying this like the second the bad thought happens, I get them all out. Sometimes, like I said, I'm still working with some that have been there the whole time. Um, but I say it, and the second it comes out, I can almost taste how bad that actually is, and that I don't actually mean those words. It was a thought that I hadn't processed yet, and we sit on these unprocessed thoughts, and it festers, and then we isolate. So James and I had that conversation and it, it really clicked that having that amount of time with that type of person who is going to listen, not so I can tell you the fucked up shit I've been through or, or you're fucked up, you need that. What happened? Okay, boom. And listen critically, it's all I needed. That is all I needed. And it, it clicked right there. So we made Project Refit. <laughs> We, we, it, it obviously, it took, so September, September of 2017 is when we got our 501c3. Um, yeah, that's the very start of it. Sure. Um, you know, the, the idea of combating isolation, um, obviously at its core, makes a ton of sense. But execution of that is different for everybody because, you know, look, solving the PTSD riddle is an individual thing. Um, very few people take the same exact path. Very few people have the same exact emotions that, that can be treated the same. Sure, there's, there's tendencies. There's sort of, uh, you know, uh, things that, that are common. Um, but again, everybody responds to stimulus differently. You stepping on a brain is something that may stick with you versus that may be not something that sticks with somebody else, but something else sticks with them. Exactly. So, you know, um, how do you guys go about doing that? So we have, so we have a couple, we have a couple avenues. So on Mondays and Fridays, we have Zooms, 9 p.m. Eastern until roughly around midnight. Um, if there's a, if there's a good conversation going, if we're not going to be, hey, it's midnight, we have to get off. Uh, but obviously if the conversation, we're good. Um, so if, if anybody ever wants to join any of these Zooms, projectrefit.us, the second you go on the website, you see join Zoom, you click that, it takes you right to us. Monday or Friday, 9 p.m. Eastern. The Monday one is live streamed to Facebook. So I, um, I actually, glo I, I didn't mention this. So in 2016, I believe it was, I had a suicide attempt. Um, I, it was the anniversary of Gunny's death. It was the anniversary of Gunny getting shot, actually. It wasn't even his death. Um, and I had downed a whole bottle of crown apple and, um, I think part of me knew I didn't want to die because I had my sleeping pills, all that shit. And then I had just bought a 200 count of Advil. Um, I was FaceTiming my friends too. So cry for help. Um, and I just ate the whole bottle of Advil. Uh, so threw that up and, 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 and nothing like I'm obviously still here. Um, so I will talk about that on the Monday Zooms. I'll talk about my time in Afghanistan. People aren't open about these things. Uh, people fear judgment. So what we emphasize at Project Refit is that when you're coming in these Zooms, we've all been through some fucking shit. And it, even if you haven't, and you're just trying to understand it, welcome, come to us. Like that's, there's no judgment whatsoever. Um, but what we do, so our, like I said, Monday and Friday, so we have, um, we have uh, topics, uh, um so we'll have like a topic in mind and then we so what we do is we'll ask we have a red green yellow system so how you go uh, where are you at today boom i'm yellow why boom talk to them for five ten minutes or if, if it's the whole sometimes it's the whole time sometimes their matter is so you know what i mean it's so pressing that we're talking to them for an hour hour and a half um so that's the zooms uh, I'll, I'll talk like i said on monday and that's just so people see we talk about it see it's not we don't believe in stigmas we don't believe that that stigmas should even be relevant. They, there is no, there's there's no positivity to a stigma. Um, uh, we so even with suicide, like suicide itself is a stigma. People people think that because they don't want to be here, they're suicidal. This is I've talked about this with my therapist, and we talk open about this on Project Refit. I believe personally, me that the majority of our people, veterans, first responders, that are killing themselves, men, anybody who's alone, that's it. They're, they feel alone. They, do, they, don't, they don't have somewhere to belong, somewhere to confide in, an unbiased opinion where they're not gonna be judged on sometimes the fucked up things they think because that's a natural way of life, especially with what we've been through and seen. 
Um, it's not available for a lot of people or they don't see it. That's what we strive to be. It's, it's, we are, the camaraderie that we had in the military, it's, it's, I don't think people, treat even people in, I don't think they truly understand the gravity that it holds. It's, it's not a brother or sisterhood. It's far, far bigger than that. We have understandings of each other without needing you that other people don't. I can talk to you. I've said so many different things to, on this podcast, acronyms, different things regular people, civilians wouldn't know that I don't have to explain because you know them. And that makes talking about it a sure. thousand times easier. So then we have the Fridays ones, and the Friday ones are not live stream. So that's personal. Anybody can still come in, veteran, first responder, support system. You can come in. You can talk. It's just not live streamed on Facebook. Um, so that's the Zooms. Um, so we – there's rules on them too. So um, respect the moderate. So myself, James, right. Mo. The different moderators, Bruno, the different moderators we have, respect our decision to drive this conversation. All right, we're going to go to, well, we don't, it's, it's veterans. First, there's a lot of strong personalities. You know what I mean? People want to talk, especially people want to talk about their things. So it's, it's respect where we're ta- telling the conversation to go. Um, we do, it's, it's, a, it's a one strike um, for this coming up. It's zero racism, homophobia, derogatory. We're vulgar. Be vulgar. That's fine. Curse. We don't care. Time and place. Not even time and place. There's a line that you do not cross. It's right, just sure. don't cross that line because we can't let you be with us anymore if you do. It, it, we, it, there's no getting around that. Um, a lot of us have TBIs. So if, if, if somebody's talking, try not to interrupt them. Like we tell people, like type it in the chat and one of us will read it or the person talking will read it so that they can finish their thoughts without losing what they're talking about. Um, Oh, and then if you are a mental health person, if you are a clinician, if you're licensed in fucking anything, and you come into our Zooms, you're welcome. You will never diagnose. This is not an arena to diagnose in. This is a peer-to-peer support, period. I'm in school right now. I'm pursuing my bachelor's for psychology. I'm going to be a mental health I'm going to. I'm going to be a therapist for combat veterans. I will never diagnose in a zoom or in project grief for that matter um there's time and place for that so that's the zooms on top of the zooms we have um we have our mobile base so it's a 24 foot long trailer that we've outfitted it's got a stage door drop down it's got like four or five to six hundred pounds um it's got like three legs it's beautiful it's got heating air lighting it's got couches in it so the whole premise behind this is we have created a comfortable arena, if you will, for us, for veterans, for first responders to come to if they're isolating. Hey, I, isolation is my thing. Like, I, I still struggle with isolation. I'm going to be honest with you. Even doing Project Reef, I still struggle with my own PTSD and my own isolation. Project Reef can come straight to my house and bring the mobile base. If I was any, any veteran, any first responder, um, it's so we can come directly to you. You can isolate, but we're going to isolate in front of your house. Or if you don't want the mobile base in front of your house, we'll go to it. We'll meet you like at a park and just chill in this. We have Wi-Fi, heating air, like I said, TV, X. But we can bullshit and just have conversations where you know I give a fuck about what you're talking about. I may not relate or understand to everything, but I understand the pain you're in. And that's another thing with the Zooms. Um, I, think, I think with us or with anybody with trauma, it's natural to compare. And we, it's not, I don't want to say it's not allowed, but we don't want you comparing. Your, sure. it's, it's incomparable. It's exactly what you just said four or five minutes ago. It's individual. Your pain, there's something you could have gone through that far supersedes anything that I went through, but you might think that, you know what I mean? It, there's too much well, shit in that. To, and there's two people who could have gone through, people in that same vehicle with you probably don't have the same feelings you do. Exactly so, true. Nobody wrong. Yes, it's exactly true. I mean, there, there's just, a, it, it's a wide variety. Uh, n- nothing about this is cookie cutter. It just genuinely yeah. isn't. There's nothing, you know, um, and we're still, in, in reality, we're still learning, Right. Uh, about PTSD and what it Absolutely. is. And, and this isn't a exact science that has, even if you could give a hundred percent clear diagnosis on a lot of things, there's still some 
outliers and tangents and, and things that uh, uh, haven't necessarily been solved yet. The, the, the Rubik's Cube isn't, isn't uh, nine-sided in this one. It's a little bit bigger yep. than that. So, yes, you it know, is. Uh, I, I think that there's, there's a lot there. And, you know, the peer-to-peer thing is so, uh, is so important. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think in general sort of what, what separates, you know, as you hit on what separates this show from a lot of others out there who interview veterans is I understand that I understand the subject matter. You know, it's easy to have the conversation with me because I've, I've felt a lot of those same feelings. I mean, it's, it's essentially almost like a, a Project Refit Zoom that we've done here in a smaller version or a more focused exactly. version just about Daniel and what Daniel was going through. And, and you know, uh, the questions I asked are based off of the fact that of empathy and sympathy and mm-hmm. the fact that I, I understand a lot of these same emotions. So um, it certainly takes the conversation to a different level. And I appreciate that about what you guys are doing. So, um, that's always good. What, what's, what's like the desired end state you guys want for project refit? I honestly want us to be a, I want us to be a national resource. Like we have the, the five day workshops that we have getting out of the military, how to, how to retire man, right. Do a resume, all those good things. There's nothing about mental health. There's nothing about getting yourself. So our name is Project Refit. What do you do when you come back from mission? You refit the vehicle, food, water, ammo, all that shit. When we're out, we're not refitting our brains. It's just that simple. We're not. We're, it's, we're, it's, it's, and this is, I have said a lot of uh, 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 definite things, black and white. I, one, I don't mean them black and white, but oh, shit, I just lost what I was going to say. <laughs> TBI kicking back in. So I know, hard ha- too. Happen, ah, happens ooh, the and then it just let go too. Um, this isn't malicious. This isn't like, it's not like it, 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 it's a part of, it's a part of it. It's that it's, it's, it's symptoms of PTSD. So for anybody listening, anything we've said, it, it's uh, me specific, specifically, it's not like you're not changing this. You're get, no, sometimes this happens. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes people catch it and go to therapy. Sometimes they don't, don't, don't do it right away or ever. And there's no judgment in any of those, um, decisions for that matter. Um, but Project Refit wants you to get better. That's the whole thing. We want you to feel purposeful again. So we have, um, uh, we have a, re- we do retreats also. So once a year we do a retreat, um, a big one, a big retreat. We have little micro retreats here and there. So the big one, we take 12 to 15 veterans slash first responders out with us. Um, so last year we went to Stillwater Ranch in Colorado. Um, we're going to be going back there this year. Um, and we camped on that ranch for six days. I'm talking tents. This is in July. So it was like hot during the day, nice at night. Like it wasn't bad at all. Um, it was very comfortable. So we do that. So every day at 8, 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. we have uh, events, fly fishing, horseback riding, archery, uh, hiking. We went to a, uh, we went to the weapons manufacturer, Phoenix Weaponry in, in, in Colorado took us to the range. Then they took nice. us back to their feminine manufacturing plant and showed us every, it was so fucking cool. Um, they were welcoming. You know what I mean? They just, it was just a very nice experience. So say like you came and you didn't want to do that shit for whatever reason. Don't you can stay at the ranch. They have 12 horses. They have uh, 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 goats, ducks. Um, but the horses is like the main thing. They're so beautiful. So nice. Um, uh, the only thing we actually made mandatory was at eight o'clock at night we had a giant bonfire and everybody sat in a circle around the bonfire and you were present you did not have to speak if you did not want to speak that's that's not a requirement but you're there and we had people come um a couple of these dudes were struggling with alcohol um to 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 a non-functioning point i think is 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 safe Mm -hmm. to say um and one of them opened up on the one night and he talked for about two and a half hours. The, the first hour, hour and a half was him talking, just unfettered, him getting what he needed out. And then the, the next like hour was like, the, you know, the people, devil's advocate or, or, hey, have you thought, or I've been through that, whatever the case may be that we're saying. Um, and you just saw a lot of healing happen. I don't like, I'm not even trying to sound like hooky or corny, but the, the one guy was drinking pretty heavy, um, even in the morning. And then after he shared that, it was the second or third night, um, the next day he had, like, he was covering his withdrawal symptoms. He was not chasing. He was not running. I mean, he wasn't running away from anything. He wasn't trying to numb. He got what he needed. He wanted right. somewhere to talk and he got that. So we've, we've seen people come just for that. If somebody, if, if on our website, if you want to come to the retreat, 
You can go projectrefit.us again. Um, you'll see retreats. You can do learn more and then you can apply. And then we'll, we'll like I said, 12 to 15. So it depends how many applications we get. Um, and then maybe we'll see you there this year. It's amazing. I mean, listen, I, I, I love it. You know, uh, one of the reasons I do, the biggest reason I do nonprofit work with veterans is just to be with veterans. That's it. You know, um, and I think that's that's ultimately, you know, being part of that that whole environment again um, with people who, who think like you do, feel what you feel and, and understand you in a way that not many others do is is a reassuring, comforting feeling. It's a safety, you know, it's a safety net. It's a warm blanket. It is. And, uh, yeah. It, it, it's and he can't really find it anywhere else. Um, and that's not to denigrate our family or our friends or other loved ones who are in our lives and anything like that. It's just a, it's it's a succinct difference uh, in, in experience that, that you can't make up for anywhere else in life. So, uh, I, I think that's great. And, you know, look, as refit continues to grow and everything else, I'm sure that the, the resources will be even better. Um, you know, I know you could continue to say that you were in therapy. Where are you right now with your own personal journey? Um, I'm just coming out of a, a plateau, I think. Um, so I've, I think I have kind of like narrowed it down that I work better with female therapists. There's just a more nurturing, in my, for me, there's just a more nurturing element mm. to them than I have experienced with my, the male therapists that I've had. Um, and that's, again, not to denigrate any of them. They, they got me to specific places also, but I work. So I just switched therapists. I just, I just, um, well, my therapist actually left. So I just got a new therapist. Um, I'm just in a new group therapy. Actually, after this podcast, I have it. I'm in between. I just had individual doing this podcast and then I'm doing group therapy. Um, so it's good. It's, it's, she's, she's really good. She's, uh, she understands where we need to focus and what's more, what's realistic to focus on and what isn't realistic to focus right. on right now. Um, so that helps. Uh, but it's, 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 it's never, an e I don't want to say it's never an easy journey, but it's something to always keep an eye on. Right. I think that I, I think that I got comfortable in the fact that I was, that I was right before COVID. I was in three different, I was in two group therapy. So on my Thursdays, I would be in therapy from like, not, uh, it was like 3 PM until eight, it was five hours of therapy. I would do individual. There'd be like a little 45 minute break and then two group therapies an hour, two hour long. Um, that was a lot, but I thrived in that. It was group therapies with Vietnam veterans. So there's some there's something about seeing, and these are so something I've seen with the veterans, there's especially the older ones, they like to joke. And I can I can work with that, but I also need you to turn that off. And if you can't turn that off, especially in group therapy, it it it, it negatively affects me. Um so, so these two groups that I was, there was none of it. There was, it, it was, these were, these were Vietnam vet, combat veterans who are dealing with their issues. They're bawling their eyes out crying. And there's something about seeing one, understanding what they went through and what that gravity is, but then also it's a grandfather. It's, 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 you know, it's, it's somebody's dad. It's a great vulnerable and crying that kind of like shook a little, uh, like some shit back there too. Like, Whoa. All right. Yeah. Do I want to get to that point where like I'm breaking down in group therapy 60 years after I've done something Now let's kind of start doing this shit now. Like let's, right. let's really take the right. reins now. So sure. I just found this, this new group therapy and I like it a lot. Um, so yeah, that's where I'm at. Um, one more, I think you started to tell me this story before, but the project refit logo where you're down on a knee and it's Bravo who's standing over you uh, pointing and looking. I think you started to started to say how that, yeah, you, you can see it right there. Yeah. Um, you started to say how that story came about, but I don't think you ever finished where, yeah, so when that this, actual moment so happened. We were, we were actually just out on, I forget what mission we were on, but I don't think it was anything like, we weren't in combat or anything. Bravo was just, he was looking to hit the saw. He was just looking but down. Bravo's the, the nickname saw. of the guy, nickname of a guy on your team. No, that's his name. Oh, is it really? Yeah. That's his last okay. name, yeah. Oh, it's, okay, his last name is Bravo. Yeah, yeah, last name, Got, yeah, yeah. Gotcha, yeah. gotcha, okay. Yeah. Um, so he was just looking down the sights of the saw, just like scanning something on the horizon that we weren't like actively in combat or anything. It looked really fucking cool. So I took the picture. Um, and then I just in, in a, in a conversation with Jane, I think it was a conversation of what are we going to do for the logo? Like how, how do, how do we do this? Um, and, uh, I guess we saw this picture and we were like, me and uh, Bravo and I is really where this started. 
the, the, the first IED is really what fucked me up the most, if we're going to be honest, right. you know what I mean? That's like the crux of my military PTSD. There's obviously the, the killing, the taking of life. There's children died, not by our hands, but children were dead. Um, so there's obviously all those things, but I took, I took sole, sole blame for the, 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 the first IED. Um, cause that was Bravo's first concussion. And then to, uh, a couple weeks after that, we had IDF and like, we weren't running to the, 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 the shelters at that point, but we were jogging maybe. He tripped on one of the tent lines. His knees hit the ground. That's his second concussion. Um, so then our second IED, the 8,500 pound one, um, I got a, so the first one, I had a, a pretty bad concussion. The second one, I had like a, a, a minor concussion, maybe, maybe like branching into my minor. Um, Bravo was black the fuck out. I had to do the fucking sternum rub on him. I had to like, he was, he didn't know, he brand new brain, didn't know who he was. Did, I thought he was dead in the seat, in all honesty. Um, he was like, like limp and lifeless, dead weight, like when you shook him kind of shit. So got him, woke him up. Like I said, he didn't know his name. Didn't know, he knew nothing. He, he had a, he had a, 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 a concussed brain that has bleeding most likely. Um, so he got medevac back and so that so he got medevac back and 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 there, there's other see that's his story now him and i don't talk anymore so i don't i don't i don't really tell his side of that story anymore does that bother but, you what uh what that him and i don't talk anymore yeah 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 it's yeah it's because it, it wasn't my wasn't my choice he he i think he doesn't want to give any of it attention you know what i mean i, I we, we were in therapy together you know what i mean Right. And I, I just think it got too much and, and he, he just, and left and it's, it, it's look, I, I've never needed somebody to understand what I've been through for me to be able to talk to them about it. Um, but knowing that somebody understood what I, like if anybody, he was in every single thing I was in. Right. Yeah. If anybody's going to understand it's him. So it, it's, it's a very, it's, it's, an, it, that's an unswallowable pill for me. Um, not having him in my life, the capacity that he was in my life, but. Is about reaching out thinking. to him? Huh? There, yeah, it, we, it's, it's, so I, and this is part of my, my issues in life. When you, when you, when you, when you mess a relationship up with me, it can't ever be what it was again. And I need it to be what it was, especially with right. him. Um, so like, I'll never, I can't trust again to the capacity that you trust that I trusted you is what that is. Um, when you burn me, you, it, it burns pretty fucking deep. Will we ever talk again? I'd like to, but we'd have to address the absence of talking first and why I need to know why. And that's selfish on my part. That is an entirely a me thing. I should respect that he doesn't want to, but I can't, I can't, I can't pretend like things are the way they were you know what i mean it's i, I need i, I need it. that yeah i, I get it. the clo the closure aspect is super important yeah uh, not not under at least if you could understand why you could process it a little bit better um and understanding why is always a tough tough thing uh it's never easy but it's a big part of um military-minded folks because everything tends to have an end in the military a succinct written documented end uh, and we're used to that. And when they don't, uh, and even being Here's killed, the unknown. even being killed in combat as a succinct documented end. Uh, and we deal with it that way, uh, as opposed to missing an action or whatever else may be. So I, I, I certainly, um, I can empathize with you there. That, that, that makes, a uh, makes, makes a lot of sense to me, at least if it's any yeah. consolation to you. Yeah, so, no, it, it is. It um, is. Well, again, check out project refit dot us. Um, there's places you can donate there. You can volunteer. You can be part of the mobile support team. Um, there's plenty of ways that you guys can help out. And best of luck, continued success with it. I hope it continues to grow. Um, and we'll certainly do our best to help you here at the Hazard Ground to let people know about Project Refit and, and what you guys are doing. Um, and again, on social media, they're all the same place, Project Refit. Yeah, at Project Refit. Yep. Um, projectrefit.us is the website. If you want to reach out to myself or James, if, if, if because I hate, you know what I mean? I hate coming phone numbers, dealing with robots, not that we have that, but if you want to direct, if you want to talk to us, um, I'm D, just D, at projectrefit.us, and James is J at projectrefit.us. If you have a veteran or first responder you think we can help, that's the other thing, really quick, sorry, we do like, 
Like we have a, an, an elderly Vietnam veteran we just got in contact with that we're having a contractor build a ramp for him because he's about to be wheelchair banned and the VA is not doing it. So things like that also. We had a, a, vet, uh, a female cop in Louisiana who her roof got ripped off in one of the last, not the last hurricane, but the one before that. We raised money, went down there, brought some volunteers and rebuilt her roof for her. We had another cop in Florida, hurricane ripped part of his, he didn't have insulation, drywall or like the, the flooring put in, in his daughter's bedrooms. Jane, he already had the supplies, but he had a broken hand. He just couldn't do it. Um, his department wasn't helping him. So we got, James and I flew out there and just put the insulation up, put the drywall up, did the floor. Like it's simple shit like that. So if you guys have any, if anybody has a veteran first responder who has needs help like that also, not saying we can guarantee do it, you know what I mean? But like that is, they are things we help with. And if it's something we can do, we will help them. Well, that's awesome. I mean, that, that, that is the, uh, the, 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 the cherry on top of all of it. So that's amazing that you guys do that. Um, again, projectrefit.us. Uh, it's been great to hear your story. Uh, you tell it so well. It's so vivid and candid and everything else. And I certainly appreciate, uh, you know, the fact that uh, you, you're in the process of healing yourself. You're willing to share that journey with everybody because I think that's also equally important. So uh, thank you so much for, for, for all your time today, brother. I agree. Thank you for having me. This is this has been one of my favorite podcasts. Again, I promise you, this is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> ProjectRefit.us. Daniel Lombard, thanks for being part of the Hazard Ground. You've been listening to the Hazard Ground podcast, hosted by Mark Zeno. If you have an interesting story to tell and you'd like to be on the show, send us an email at producer at hazardground.com. And if you like the show, Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.